welcome. Hello, I'm Paul Cowling from Film Independent, and welcome to our Thursday Coffee Talk. Um, before we start, another reminder that uh, May for Film Independent is Members Month. We have a special running right now that if you join Film Independent, you get two extra months free. That's 14 months, price of 12. That applies to all memberships, both new and renewing, and all membership levels as well. So find out more at filmindependent.org. Uh, today, we've got two good friends of the organization with us, um, two fantastic uh, indie ladies. Uh, I'll do my intros. Well, I'll start with the person I invited first, our good friend, uh, Lulu Wong, who um, won Best Feature this year's uh, Film Independent Spirit Awards for her movie, The Farewell. Also won Best Supporting Female. Uh, and she's also a Bonnie um, award nominee this year. Um, her other film is, of course, uh, Posthumous. Uh, with us, Lulu Wong. How, hey, Lulu, how are you doing? Hi, good, good. Thanks for having me. How, how are you doing up there? Where, where are you? In LA, right? I'm in LA, yeah. Um, I'm doing okay, you know, trying to stay sane and trying to stay productive and just keep working. Um, but we're lucky everyone's safe and, you know, so we feel pretty grateful. Cool. And when I asked you to do this, you said you'd love to. I asked you, like, who would you like to chat with? And you're like, I know just the person. My good friend, Mariel Heller, who um, won Best First Feature at the Spirit Awards a few years ago for The Diary of a Teenage Girl. Uh, she went on to direct uh, Would You Ever Forgive Me? And last year's A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Uh, she's also a nominee for the Bonnie Award this year at the Spirit Awards. Uh, welcome, Mariel. Hi. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. You are on the East Coast, right? How, where are you? I'm in Connecticut. We, we fled where we live in Brooklyn, and we're really lucky to have a, a place to come in Connecticut. So I've gone from cosmopolitan lifestyle to basically living the farm life. My husband's splitting wood in front of me as I'm speaking to you all with our kid. <laughs> <laughs> we're very we jealous of that. In the background. If, if we hear axe chopping in the background, we'll know what that is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, there are yeah. wild turkeys walking through. It's very, it's, it feels like the opposite of normal life. It's very odd. We could get wood from you guys because yeah. we're always looking for wood in the city. We're like, where do we get wood for our fireplace? Yeah. I'll mail you some. Excellent. So the way these work uh, for first time viewers, uh, I'm going to step back. I'll turn my camera off and let these two fantastic filmmakers uh, chat and talk shop for about half an hour. And then we're going to take questions from the audience. I use the question button at the bottom of the screen. We'll try and get to as many of those as possible. I'll come back in about half an hour to field those questions. But uh, Lulu and Marielle, take it away. Okay. Hi, Lulu. Hey, Mari. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you and I have been living weirdly parallel lives on different coasts, sort of, since we've both been heading up writer's rooms right leading into this pandemic. How are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm doing good. I just finished my pilot, so I feel great. Um, it's just, you know. Can I finish? Like, done, done? Well, like the first draft, but, you know, you feel good for a second, and then you get the notes, yeah. and you're just like, uh, I was there last week. I'm one week I'm one week ahead of you, so I feel terrible right now. Oh. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Not, re not really. I'm not going to think about that. I'm going to enjoy this moment. Um yeah, yeah, but you know, at least like, are you still are you still running a room or are you um, completely? No, so we did like a little mini room. Um, I'm I'm leading this writers room with the project that I'm doing with um, this American Life and my company through Big Beach, and so it's we did like a four week writers room and then went off to each write our scripts. So I'm in the phase now of like I finished my pilot a week ago. Everybody's sending me their drafts and I'm giving notes. What what about you? Um, same. Yeah. So you are a week ahead. Like we were going to finish our drafts and then go back into the room to yeah. all discuss and re-break whatever we might need and talk about notes together. So right. we basically just eliminated that second part of the room. Mm -hmm. Um, Smart. and so yeah, we're just draft doing drafts and then, and then second drafts. It's so funny that you say this American life and big beach, because those are my partners for the farewell. We're, yeah. yeah, connected. <laughs> Very connected in many, many ways. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, well, how, how, how are you finding writing during the pandemic? Um, I mean, truthfully, I feel really not productive and it, it feels like um, it's just a bit of a slog to try and get through the day. I mean, I'm, I'm a mom, you know, as you know, so like, and we're trying to homeschool. And um, so Yorma and I are basically splitting up the day and we each get about three hours to write every day. Um, you know, which really means like two hours. <laughs> and there's always, Wiley's always running in and interrupting. And so it just feels really hard to concentrate and to like emotionally be present in the writing, but it's good to have something to focus on. It feels really good to like have something separate from this life to just yeah. kind of escape into. I don't know. I kind of, I feel weirdly jealous of my friends who don't have kids because I feel like maybe I could be being so productive during this pandemic if I wasn't also trying to become a teacher of a kindergartner. Well, I mean, Barry and I talk all the time about how people with kids do it because we have a hard enough time focusing just with the news, you know, the state of the world and everything. Um, and it feels like the day just flies by every day. And yeah, just mentally it's hard because you're like not sure what's going to happen. Are we even going to be able to shoot things that we're writing? I know. So, I, I mean, I tell a lot of my friends not to feel guilty if they can't write, if they're not productive. Because um, I think that's like a pretty common thing where where everyone feels like they, you know, have to be the most productive they've ever been and, and use this time somehow. Um, I know. It's like I used to talk about how my favorite time in New York was when there would be a blizzard or like a subway strike or something that would make it that I had to stay home because I was always so productive. But this feels so different because I think the emotional anxiety and the fact that we're all just feeling nervous for the future of the world and the future of our families and all of those things. It just makes it hard to kind of imagine being in production again. <laughs> I don't yeah. Know. yeah. Well, let's talk about maybe um, um, something happier. Maybe yeah, I agree. Tell people how we met. Um, oh yeah. Let's go into that. Cause that was the, the first thing I, cause Paul said, Oh, it should be really, you know, casual and who can you just forever <laughs> with? And I was like, ah, uh, duh. Um, I think that's right. I know, but do you remember the actual first time we met? Because we have our very clear bonding trip, essentially. Yeah. But um, we, we sort of connected because we were both making movies with Big Beach. You yeah. were making Farewell. I was making A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Pretty it's, close in time. Yeah, did we run into each other in the hall? Like, I remember you guys had a meeting one time, and I forget what, we had just come back from China or something, but you guys were, like, in a room having a meeting. Maybe. My first real memory of us like actually chatting was maybe at a UTA party or something like that and getting to be like. Yeah. Well, you know what? I think that we also met at uh, the Spirit Awards the year we did. before that, right? We did. We yes. Carrie and you were with your, you guys were yes. there, and we kind of passed. And we were all going to the bathrooms and we all chatted and Barry had won yes. and had been, had made a very sweet speech and yeah, that was a really fun moment. Yeah, so the Spirit Awards were one of the first times we hung out. Yeah, um, I love the Spirit Awards. They're so yeah. fun. So fun. Um, um, but then our friendship really, you know, hit hit its stride when I posted something on Instagram <laughs> that I was going to Berlin for the first time um, because I was working on a project in the fall and yeah. I was going to Berlin without my family for the first 10 days or something like that. And you immediately wrote me and were like, I'm showing up in Berlin tomorrow. No, I'm pretty sure it was, I'm, sh I'm landing in an hour. Because oh yeah, you were on the plane. <laughs> right. I was on the plane when I saw your Instagram and I was like, wait, what? And then, and here's the thing, right? Like I feel like um, direct, well, particularly women directors, we've been trying to find ways of like forming community, being friends, yeah. but um, I don't have a lot of director friends. Um, no, I have like my group of director friends that are from the Sundance Labs and I hold on to those friendships like they mean so much to me because the, it's such a lonesome job. As a director, it's so rare that we get to talk to other people who do what we do. It's yeah. so fun when you get to talk to other directors. Yeah. And so immediately I was like, wait, when do you land? When can we hang out? <laughs> yeah, I was like, well, I land in an hour and then, you know, I got to get my bags and then I got to get to check into my apartment. 
Um, it, that I was, was like, I'll just be waiting for you. <laughs> yeah, you were like, I'm not doing anything. I'll just have a drink and wait for you. Yeah. Um, and it was so, it was such a weird night because I had some issues with my Airbnb. Oh, yeah, it took you a while. It took me a really, because they gave me the wrong key or they left the wrong, I forget now, right. but, and it was also raining. So I'm sitting in the law, in the like, you know, downstairs outdoor area, like courtyard area, waiting for the guy to like go across the city to bring me a new set of keys. And I'm like, I'm right. sorry. And my phone was about to die. I was like, is this going to happen at all? I know. And we really didn't know each other that well at that point, too. I know. And I was we like, I'm up- not a flaky person. I feel so bad. <laughs> She's I knew that. For me. But we ended up having like the best time for so many days. We got to hang out a bunch of times and have a lot of drinks. I I taught you about a Boulevardier. You did. Oh my gosh, I forgot about a Boulevardier. I haven't been drinking them because Barry drinks Manhattans a lot, so we end up making black Manhattans mostly. But yeah, I've got to change that. I mean, I love a Manhattan, but yeah, I taught you about a Boulevardier, and I was like, oh yeah, we'll be fast friends. Yes. Well, I showed up that night and I was like, I need a drink. And you were like, I've had three, catch up. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Um, it was so rare for me to be in another country without my family too. Mm-hmm. And then we had that um, dinner with your family, or at least with Yorma, at yeah. that little vegetarian place. Which was on my birthday, on my 40th birthday. Right. I got to celebrate your birthday with you. Yeah, which was so fun. Um, oh no, my kid's trying to come in the door. Wiley, you can't come in right now. Yorma. Yorma. But I need to tell you something. A one piece fell on him and he started going. Thank you for telling me. (laughs) (laughs) See, this is the magic of, um, you know, of these kinds of things. Like whether it's a Zoom meeting or a live interview. This would never happen if we were on a stage. It's true. In a theater. Although the number of times that that's happened while I'm being interviewed or something, I can't even count. But yes, it's true. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. So what, um, how are you feeling about kind of getting back into production and what do you miss most right now about being in this world? Not, uh, not actually being in production right now. Well, I'm Barry and I were just talking about it because my TV series that I'm writing, it takes place in Hong Kong. So I think everyone is excited about it because, um, you know, that part of the world might be ready before, well, well, probably will be ready before we are for production. So we were just talking about what the process would be like, yeah, will we be tested would we be quarantined before we start production? Um, Cause I'll, I don't know about Hong Kong, but I know South Korea has reported zero cases for you know several days now. Right. So uh, does that mean the entire country is safe? Like if we test and then we're, so Barry said, we'll probably be tested, land, be quarantined for mm. two weeks or right. whatever, test it again. And then there's probably going to be all kinds of restrictions where you can only go from here to here to here in order to keep the crew safe. So that's terrifying because, I mean, so much of, I've never shot a film in the U.S. And uh, I've always been, you know, every project I've ever made has been abroad. And so much of um, my process in the prep period is incorporating things that I discover in the city into the script to make it feel Uh authentic and organic. And so it's like, if you can only go to these designated places, if you can't just stumble around the city. Interesting. Yeah. How, how do you really feel the life of that place? Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I know it's hard to imagine production because production is so, it's such a big operation with so many people and it feels like everybody's so close and kind of you're spending so much time together. It's hard to picture how how this is all going to work. And I miss that. Like, I miss the feeling of being, uh, you know, I mean, I I talk about filmmaking so much as such a lonesome undertaking with the exception of production, which feels like suddenly you have, you you prep for so long and it feels so lonely, especially before you're in official prep. It feels like you're writing and you're alone with your thoughts. And then all of a sudden you have like 200 best friends who are all there to make the movie with you. Yeah. And it feels so collaborative and it feels so great. At least it's one, it's my favorite 
part of the whole filmmaking process. Yeah, me too. And I love it. I know. And, and, and then you go into post and post feels once again, lonely. I mean, it's fun, but it feels like writing a lot. It's like just living with you and your editor so much of the time. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, I'm in post on one small project right now. I'm writing on another project. Those were the, the very isolated times anyway, but it's hard to picture what that middle period will be like. Yeah. I mean, especially with a TV series, cause, um, it's interesting cause Barry, I feel like Barry and I are also like kind of synced the way you and I are like, I'm one step behind him. He just, mm-hmm. um, he worked with a 24, I worked with a 24 and then he just wrapped his show with Amazon underground railroad and he's now right. in post and now I'm writing and going to go into production with a show with Amazon. Um, and you know, he's, he shot like 118 days or something like that. He was basically in production. He for told me that, which hurts my head to think about 118 days. It's crazy. Uh, but you're, I mean, the tough thing is that you don't get much more time than an indie film, right? Like that's What's the that? crazy thing. I mean, I, well, for prep and also for shooting, because yeah, pages per day. Pages per day, like, you know, it's a massive project. It's a much higher yeah. budget. But, I, you know, we're starting to talk about that because I had 24 days in China to shoot The Farewell, which is a 90-minute movie. Um, for I TV. did Diary in 24. Yeah, and then for TV uh, is what, like, the, the average is, like, 12 to 14 days, 14, 15, if you're lucky, per episode. Right. So for a 60-minute episode. Right. If you're so, lucky. Yeah. If you're lucky, right? I mean, so, but that's an hour. I mean, you do them, like yeah. the number of pages is, is like an independent film. But anyways, 118 days for a whole year with two hiatuses built in or whatever, you're spending your whole year with this crew, they're your family. Yeah. And, and suddenly, and they got cut off three days before they finished, but then they came back. Um, because and, and of the coronavirus, was, they got cut off three days before? Oh. Just, so they were. Oh my God! I can't imagine going 118 <laughs> days and being so close to being done and it being called. That's. And then not having a wrap party, not having the know. of like, it's just it's so. But he's so lucky. I mean, being, you know, having something in the can right now is just such gold. Yeah, and and, and especially when it's like 11 episodes. I mean. Yeah, the and, number of people I know who have been in production that got called off or they were in prep, you know, people who were prepping movies and they were like four weeks into prep, four weeks out from filming and just everything paused. That's such a hard place to be. Whereas it's such a great place to be if you're editing right now, because we can edit from home. We can do color correction from home. We can sound mix from home. We can do all of these post things. Yeah. I mean, Um, that's why I'm grateful for the writing too, because yeah, even though it is lonely, like it is, it's what gets me through the day when I can finish an episode, when I can think about, you know, the excitement of going into production one day, whenever that is. Um, and, you know, and, and, and I just keep thinking like, if, if it takes longer than expected, then I'll write the feature. I'll write another feature. I'll write, you know, cause I, I think for me, I don't know how you feel about this, but the hardest thing is, finding the time to write. Cause you're like going, 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 you, you're in production, you edit, you're on the award circuit. And then everyone's like, what are you making next? And you're like, Oh, I got to write for three years or however long it takes yeah. now to even find the next thing. Um, and so, yeah, no, I agree. I, I mean, having the luxury of time is a really great thing in some ways right now. I mean, how are you feeling about the difference between TV and film? Like what it, have you done TV before? Never. I've never been in a writer's room. I've never. Me neither. Me neither. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Wait, but you've directed episodes. I've directed TV. I've directed TV, but I've never been in a writer's room. It was just funny to like run a writer's room when I was like, I've never even been in a writer's room. I mean, Yorma has, my sister has like so many of my dear friends. I know what their lives are like in writer's rooms. So I don't feel like it's so foreign, but. You know, it's, I think it's the same thing I felt when I started directing because I didn't go to film school. Yeah. Where I was like, am I doing this right? Is this the way you're supposed to do this? <laughs> you know, and everybody's kind of like, there's no right way to do it. Do you feel like it helped? Like, how was your experience running a writer's room if you haven't been in one before? Like, did it 
Do, like, and, and the feedback from your writers. The feedback from my writers is like, oh, this has been the best writer's room I've ever been in. This is so, feels so um, collaborative and responsive. You know, I mean, I have a really, I have a very strong philosophy that you don't need to suffer in order to make good art. Mm -hmm. So really early on, you know, like I, um, and it's also part of my whole thing where I want to do French hours and I, I believe in having a life outside of filmmaking. So I leave prep at five, I leave the edit at five or 5.30 so I can go put my kid to sleep. Um, so similarly, I was like, yeah, we're gonna work from nine to four or nine to three and have like a regular life while we do this writer's room. Like, I don't wanna make anybody feel like we're just sitting around checking YouTube on our phones while we should be just focusing, you know? So I think everybody kind of appreciated that I wasn't gonna waste their time and yeah. that we were just gonna kind of do our work and go home. <laughs> I don't know that I didn't, um, cause so much of what I've heard from so many of my friends in terms of complaints about writer's rooms is like, yeah, people trickle in, you spend the first three hours messing around, checking the news and like, then everyone expects you to stay till 11 PM and you know. I know, and my writers were telling me that too. And they were saying, you know, this room feels so like free and, and it's like surprising how much work we get done for how many, like the limited number of hours. Cause we did like yeah. 10 to four, sometimes 10 to five, we would just stay a little bit longer. We would take yeah. a walk after lunch or whatever. And I didn't know that you were supposed to like have official, like today, so-and-so gets to pitch a story or so-and-so get like- Me neither, no. I would you just told to be like, me that. I pitch it. I was like, what do you mean pitch? Just talk, like you have an idea, talk, you know? And they yeah. were like, wait, am I? And it, I, I think that helps to not have, have well, been to that like, hierarchy. To I had no hierarchy. We didn't have a hierarchy. We didn't have like a number two in the room or, we didn't have anyone in, everyone was in the same position. That was part of what I was clear about. You know, I've worked with a writing partner before. So I was like, I'm just gonna treat this like I'm working with a writing partner, like, which is very different than writing alone. And it's a very different process than when you write alone. There's so much more discussion about before you kind of lock into an idea. Um, but I, yeah, we just kind of treated it like that. Um, and it felt really natural. I was nervous about it before we started that I was gonna do it wrong or not know what I was doing. But ultimately it felt totally fine. Yeah. Fine. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I can't, I can't recreate that energy on Zoom. Like we've had a hard time having, you know, five, six people on a Zoom conference and, and still try to keep that energy because everyone's on different time zones. You yeah. Know? much going on and jokes don't land like someone will like <laughs> the timing's, all the wrong. timing's like, off I agree you can't like, get those like, private jokes going of like remember over lunch when you said this <laughs> yeah and then I'll be like wait I'm sorry I think that she just made a joke but you just can we can you repeat that it is like not the same it's terrible uh, so it's I really terrible. Miss, I really miss the writers room. and it's so sad because our office got shut down like uh, we were in uh, uh, the WeWork building and you know we just like had to pull out of it and so they were like yep we're gonna move all your stuff into storage come get whatever you want it was so sad because we had basically left it expecting to come back in two weeks wow. and like, yeah, we like coffee mugs and stuff. we sort of called it a little bit early because we had people who had come from LA to New York and we just felt like let's let everybody get home. Like, I don't want anybody to feel like they're being held here and people were riding the subway to work and it just felt like, I don't know, the writing was on the wall. We, we were making a lot of jokes when the whole coronavirus pandemic began. We were like, okay, so we've got seven neurotic women in a room. Like we are so up on this virus. We were like the most paranoid, nervous room about what was happening. Like we were so ahead of the curve that we kind of called it early. Well, that's good. At least yeah. you saw it coming. We didn't. We were, we were like, wait, when did your room end, though? Well, we were supposed to end, it was supposed to end uh, March 13th or whatever that Friday was. Um, and we called it on, like, that Monday wow. before. So, like, the 8th or 9th. The weekend before, me and the producers got on the phone and said, we got to let the people from L.A. go home and let everybody work remotely this last week. So that was our final week anyway. Um, so yeah, 
It was, what a weird time. But I agree, Zoom isn't the same. It just doesn't feel the same. Yeah. It's really hard. I mean, I, I already hated conference calls and how many people are trying to talk over each other on conference calls. Yes. It, this, it's the exact same issue. It's yeah. just really hard. Yeah, the lag. I, I think one-on-one -on -one is okay, but you yeah. know, you get into like so many people, yeah. Yeah, you can't get a group dynamic going. Yeah. Which so much of a writer's room feels like it's about the sort of everybody having their own position within the room, everybody having their own like role they play. Yeah. And yeah. Are, you, are you excited about um, directing? And, and how many how many episodes are you directing? It's going to be six. And so we'll see. I mean, it's, it's hard to figure out when it will happen. <laughs> Truthfully, I mean, everything feels like it's slightly on pause in terms of timing, you know, our hope. I think our hope probably was to go in the fall, but it is set in New York. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I just feel like re it, it's such a hard thing because so much of so much of how I've sort of approached filmmaking always is that you set a goal and just go forward toward it. Like I'm filming in the fall. This is what I'm doing. And you just start chipping away at making plans. Yeah. That's how I got my first movie made was like I declared at a certain point that we were filming, even though we didn't have all the money together and we didn't have everything we needed. But it was like you have to kind of have a goal and just work toward that goal. Right. But right now in time, that feels impossible. You know, it feels like trying to predict the future to try and um, plan toward a goal. So yeah. I don't know. I know what you mean. I'm sort of like my goal right now, it's almost like I'm hoarding my own writing. Like I'm like, within this time, I'm gonna just try to hoard as many pieces of writing as possible oh smart so then maybe in the neck like i have a feature and here's two tv series and you know and here's another idea and then by the end of it at, at least once this is all over then i don't have to go back into the writing i'll just be i'm shooting. gonna steal that as like a philosophy to try to keep in my head during this time because i think that is a good way to look at it is like and i agree it's really hard to find time when you're making movies, like, and I love making movies, but they take so much time. And I'm not one of those people who's great at leaving the edit room and going and writing. Like David Lowry, who I'm friends with, makes me feel so lazy because we'll be texting, we'll both be editing a movie or something. And I'll be like, how's it going? And he's like, good. And then I go home from the edit room and I write for four hours. I'm like, what? I go home from the edit room and have a drink, put my kid to bed and watch The Real Housewives. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I just don't understand. I don't, I'm not that prolific. I can't do it. And I can't multitask on multiple projects like that. I, I mean, it was so, it was so hard for me to be putting out Can You Ever Forgive Me while I was making A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. That was like, it felt like I was cheating on one project with the other one the whole time. <laughs> and I felt totally like split. It didn't feel good. So I don't know. I, I'm not good at that process of like, constantly having the other thing I'm writing while I'm also working full time on something else, which some people just are great at. Yeah, when I try to work on multiple things, which I am right now, there's another feature that I'm not writing, but I'm working with the writer and I end up getting the two projects confused and they end up thematically, like not intentionally, it's just kind of melding together. Right, because it's, so like, it's what's in your heart in the moment, what you're feeling and thinking about. That makes total sense. Yeah. yeah. And I, like confusing I'm and, and I'm even now thinking I've got to find a way to separate these projects so that they're different so that they tonally feel different so that they are exploring the different things because right, right now I'm in it so all of the themes can be the same but once I shoot and I spend like a year working on one project I'm not going to want to explore those same topics again in another thing and and nope. I yeah know. Yeah, it's a really interesting, it's an, it, it's interesting about whose people, whose brains kind of work well like that, you know, who can kind of multitask in that kind of way and live in multiple worlds. Because I'm with you, it's sort of what, wherever I am, whatever mood I am in ends up affecting my work so much. Yeah, you know, I thought a lot about how I probably wouldn't have made a beautiful day in the neighborhood if it hadn't been under the Trump presidency. Like, mm -hmm. there was something about I felt like I needed that movie. Mm -hmm. Like I felt 
like that was what I wanted to put in the world and it felt very connected to politics and similarly when I made the diary of a teenage girl I thought I don't know if I would have felt safe to make this movie currently like mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. um but in 2014 or 13 when I filmed it now I can't remember what year it was but you know it was there was something to resist against there was a safety within our kind of political system that made me feel like I could explore certain things I don't know yeah it changes based on where you are absolutely and and also where you are in your life you know like if yeah. uh if you're single if you're about to have a new baby if you're you know all of the fears and all of the questions in your mind go into the of course, how could they not i mean what are going to be all of the movies that come out of this time <laughs> like is it going to be pandemic movies or is it going to be like some idyllic version of the world is it going to be people making movies about like baking bread <laughs> I, don't know. I mean i i i hope my hope is that they're not too literal like, cause I, I, I want, I'm excited to see what comes out of, you know, people's creative minds during this period. Yeah. But my hope is that they're not all just uh, pandemic movies, literally about a pandemic, about zombies, about whatever, but that yeah. people can really speak in metaphors, you know? No, and I do think there's something so um, grounding about what's happening where so many of us are feeling like, the trappings of everyday life and the distractions of everyday life are being stripped away from us and we are kind of being brought brought to our knees in some way to deal with things in a more simple way. I think it's also a really challenging time for people with mental health issues and yeah. it's a time when people are being, not having those distractions is a tricky thing as yeah. well. Yeah. But I am curious what it will do kind of for the collective conversation that we're having in terms of film and tv of like what what will be this era how will this era of filmmaking be defined yeah i mean and it's interesting because barry and i talk all the time about how when we first started as filmmakers uh the limitations in many ways even like i didn't go to film school but i took a film class and how limitations can often be so great for creativity. It's like, okay, so make a project where there's no dialogue because you're shooting on Super 8 and you're not gonna have sound. And so you try to use that within, as part of the conceit of the story that you're telling. Um, and so that's the, that's the thing I try to hold on to is that, you know, whatever the limitations are coming out of this, even if we can't shoot the things we're writing now, can we write something that works within the limitations that yeah. we're Give it. You know, in certain ways, the scariest thing to me is the idea of just having enough money to do whatever you want because you won't be as creative. Right. You really want to be kind of pushing up against having to come up with solutions and compromises that push you further creatively because I, I agree, it helps you. Yeah. And I mean, within limits, but, <laughs> but it does help you. Yeah. Hi, Paul. We see you click Hello. back. Hi. Hi. I'm back. <laughs> Have we reached um, our, our 30 limit, uh, thirty minute limit? I told you, Mari and I can talk forever. I know. I feel like we we're just having a private conversation. Have we actually talked shop enough? Yeah, no. I, I can leave you alone if you want for another two hours. So we, <laughs> we, we 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 have about twenty five minutes or so of questions. Um, okay. Before we get to questions, Mari, I just want to say I think your daughter will make a great director. Uh, yes, Wiley is a director in the making in a way that is problematic. For our yes. family. But that's what happens when you have two director parents. Um, She's like, I'm going to close this door after I've told you what I need to tell you. Yes, we, we, we tried to take a birthday picture for a friend yesterday, and Wiley decided um, to stop the whole thing, had a new concept. We had to sit on the couch in a certain way and do a headstand, and like would not let us take the picture the way we wanted to take the picture. Oh. So, yes. So we have uh, a lot of questions. Uh, people can submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen there. Um, uh, Ida or Ada, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, is firstly says thank you for being, so, thank you so much for being incredibly vulnerable and honest. Uh, there are some, some pandemic, pandemic related questions. I'll try and group them together. Lisa Lehman, our good friend Lisa. Hi Lisa. I would love to know what production safety protocols you're hearing and what we could look for in terms of guidelines. Will drafts be released? 
Um, and also a, a question about um, projects that potentially could be produced during extended lockdown periods, like animation, virtual, or any sort of out of the yeah. box methods. I, I don't think any protocols are official yet. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of talk and you know, one of the things that's been going around was this idea of people making movies coming and self quarantining for two weeks before you start and then you can't see anybody else, which goes so against for me, everything I believe about making movies that we should all be able to be with our families and see our kids and like continue our lives while we make movies. And so obviously that's a protocol that I won't be able to make a movie under that kind of, you know, protocol. It just wouldn't work for me with what I believe. Um, but I think a lot of people would be willing to do that. And it'll be, it'll mean a lot of childless people or people who are willing to leave their families, you know, going to make movies. Lulu? Uh, yeah, like Mari said, nothing, I, I don't know anything official. It's just mostly, um, you know, Barry and I talking about what we've heard or what, you know, the speculation is, uh, and we were talking about this earlier about, um, just, you know, what are the locations that are going to open up first? What are the projects that are, you're able to shift the location? Um, I don't think anybody really knows. No, um, people are talking about, people are making jokes sort of about like filming a sex scene with two people in different rooms or, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of kind of like chatter about all of the ridiculous ways which we will try to make movies with limited crew and all of that or doing things on sound stages um where things end up kind of being more like the way we used to make movies in the old days and and again like you know because um the series i'm working on is abroad i think that that's maybe one of the reasons they're you know people are more hopeful because you're taking crew and they're gonna you know be away from family anyways like whoever comes and whoever is local which is very different from shooting locally where people do go home and do see their friends and do have like in many ways like if you know we go to hong kong our team will probably be in one hotel under a certain amount of lockdown everyone's tested everyone's quarantined you're in a country that has no new cases whatever mm -hmm. that might be why they're pushing this particular project or th those projects that are able to shoot in those places. Right. Um, Shalako asks, how do you think new filmmakers will enter the industry under current circumstances? Would Quibi-like projects be a strategy worth pursuing? I mean, I always say whatever you can do to make things you should do and that, um, you know, nobody's going to, nobody's going to do it for you. Nobody's going to believe in you until you've made something. So finding people that you want to work with, who you agree with creatively. I mean, my biggest jealousy about not going to film school was really that I didn't get to get a community of people who I wanted to work with. Yeah. Um, and I, I felt like I got that through the Sundance labs, but it was so different and later on. Um, and it felt so good to have other people who you could actually trust from a creative standpoint. So I think obviously there's so many places now to make content and you, but you really have to kind of establish who you want to be as a filmmaker and make something that really represents you. I think it's always a tricky thing if you're trying to fit into a box. You know what's interesting I just thought of and I haven't thought of before is because we're, we're all thinking about, you know, the films that are coming out this year, the festivals that are shut down. Um, so those films are not able to be released. But let's say that things get back up next year and you have Sundance and um, South by and Tribeca and all these festivals, but what are the short films that are going to be submitted or, or feature films? Like what are the films that are going to be submitted if not, if people are not making things? As I mean, there's always lag time, right? So there are movies that weren't ready for Sundance this year, but that are being edited right now that may end up there next year. True. And I mean, I think it's going to be, but I agree. There's going to be this weird lag time. There's going to be some period of time where we catch up, and run out of things and maybe yeah. it's animated. I mean, obviously animated projects are able to move forward in a way that most other things aren't. Yeah, and I do wonder if people, you know, cause Barry and I are always, 
we'll drive by restaurants that are closed or stores that are closed. And it's like, is this a time in which someone really creative might reach out to a restaurant that's closed and say, and have an idea that takes place entirely in a high end fine dining restaurants that, that is closed right now and say, Hey, we don't have a lot of money, but we'll give you this. If you let us use our space, it's only five people you know, me, my DP, my sound guy, two other crew member, and then the two actors or whatever, like a really tight unit. But maybe you're able to leverage like locations and things that you weren't able to before that were when they were open. It's true. I, I worry, you know, I worry about the below the line people and the crew members who are going to be seen as being obsolete or like who we're going to be constantly trying to work around giving people jobs and I feel like production value will suffer because of that. I mean, I I have a lot of crew friends who I feel like are seeing people discuss their jobs being taken away, you know, as like, we don't need you. We'll do it really small. We'll we'll do a guerrilla style without all these, all of these extra people. But of course those extra people have very vital jobs on film sets. We have quite a few questions about first features, getting first mm-hmm. features off the ground. Brittany asked you both about the process of getting them off the ground and any, any things that you did that helped sort of set up those features. Uh, Jeremy asked you, Lulu, specifically about the process for getting posthumous off the ground. And there's another question here um, from Kamisha, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, about getting the financing for your first features. You want to hit it first or me, Lilo? Well, I had a very unusual first feature experience. So it's um, it's not one that I, I, I would say that um, is typical for, for most filmmakers. Um, I started working with a friend who I didn't realize uh, was able to really finance a film of that size. Um, we just started working together out of passion and we, you know, she wanted to make a romantic a screwball romantic comedy. So I really, and, and said, let's shoot it in one room and keep it really limited, um, you know, micro budget. Uh, and so that I specifically wrote that script because she was willing to give me even a micro budget to, to work on some, to make something. Um, and so I had pitched a couple different things and then Posthumous ended up being the one that uh, we agreed on. And then the project snowballed, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but I think that I was very naive and I just always said, I'm going to make it. I don't care how it snowballs. And even if Bernadette can't finance it, we'll find the rest of the financing. So we just kept pushing it. And, um, and then luckily she was able to finance it. Uh, and, and I could not have anticipated that when we first met or when we even first started working on the project. Um, but that said, you know, my first feature wasn't something that I had written just for me and self like raise the money. And and so, you know, the farewell became a much more personal project and in many ways, a harder project to finance. Like that was a project where I got a lot of no's where um, with posthumous, it was like, I found the financing first. I found someone who was willing to take a shot on me and I wrote a project to fit that. Mm -hmm. I I had sort of the opposite, which was that I was, not a director yet, but I had a project that I was passionate about that I had been writing and working on for years and years and years. And I was trying to figure out how to make it into a movie. And I was so sure I wanted to make it into a movie, but I wasn't even sure that I wanted to be a filmmaker. But I just, it wasn't like I want to make a movie, but for me it was, I want to make this movie and then maybe I'll never make a movie again. But um, I, I was lucky enough to get the advice from Ann Carey, who was a producer who I knew at the time, she basically said, nobody's going to want to make this movie. You should apply to the Sundance Labs because it would give you some legitimacy if you got in. And um, and and I applied to the Writer's Lab and got in, and that kind of changed the trajectory for me. It didn't make it easier to make it, because I think making your first movie is so hard no matter what, and nobody's... I mean, it's so rare for somebody to say like, I want to take a chance on you. Let's make a movie. I mean, mostly I think it's um, blood, sweat and tears that make a first movie. And it usually takes, you know, I worked on diary all told about 10 years. And um, 
for me, it was like tiny little steps along the way more than I could possibly, you know, go through in, a, in an answer right now. But like getting a small grant from the Maryland Film Festival that let me make a short film that I got to Kristen Wiig and got her signed on and used that to go to financiers and got them to sign on for part of the money and then brought on other people. It was just like over many years chipping away and at some point saying, we're shooting in the fall <laughs> and just deciding and pushing forward and pretending that I knew what I was doing when I didn't. Yeah, and I don't think there's like one way to make a first feature or what, what no. that first feature has to look like nowadays. Um, it's because I have many friends who have been trying to get their personal projects off the ground, haven't been able to, but are offered a studio project um, because mm -hmm. they've done like TV series or they've, they've show run before. And so there's a company that's willing to give them, you know, a genre project that's not necessarily theirs in that same kind of way. Um, but they're given an opportunity to make something. And I think the question becomes, do I say no to these things to make sure that the first thing I do is really personal is my own story is something that I've written uh, or and and that's a really hard question because um, question. Of, because of course if like that studio project ultimately doesn't end up being your in your voice or you don't think it's good and you're taking notes from a studio because it's really their project your name is attached to it but at the same time it's a chance to like pop that first feature you know, cherry, which in a way, like you get judged when you haven't made a first feature or you haven't made anything. Yeah. Else. I think it's a privileged position to be able to even talk about whether you would take that job or not, obviously. But I think if you can, if you can try to make your first feature something that is actually from your voice, whether or not you wrote it, hopefully you did, but whether or not you did, it's something that reflects the type of filmmaker you want to be. I think that's how you stand out. I do think that's how you make a first feature or for you, I think what you're kind of saying is like the farewell function does that, that gives gives you a certain amount of, just people understand who you wanna be as an artist. They're like, okay, I see you. Um, it, and I think it's tricky when people kind of feel like they need to take a project because it's gonna get made, but it may not actually reflect who they wanna be as an artist. Yeah, it is tricky, but you know, I also, for me, I know that I wouldn't have made the farewell the way it, it was made if I hadn't made posthumous because I didn't go to film school. I'd never been on a set. So in many ways, my approach to posthumous was as a producer was really learning or as a film school student, really learning like how to run a set, you know, even learning what coverage meant. And then on the farewell, I was able to say, you know what, I don't need coverage. Like I feel very confident that this shot is going to work in a one -er, and I can just get the master and I'd rather spend the entire time getting this blocking and right on this master because that's what I want to use because it's riskier. Right. Whereas on my first feature, I, I, for me anyways, I, I took less risks just because I really didn't know what I was doing and relied a lot more on my crew. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, everybody has different, um, uh, like perspectives, like, you know, a woman of color, their, their story might not be getting the financing, um, mm -hmm. the support if it's a subtitled film that someone else might. And so it, it, just to get them going, just to make something, just to do something, just to keep learning, you know, get on a set, direct something, you might want to say yes yeah. to that. Job. But it's not an easy question. I have a question for you, Mari, about, um, the Diary of a Teenage Girl. I mean, one of the things that you don't do when you make a film, if you want to keep your budget down, is make a period film. And yeah. this is set at San Francisco in the 70s. So how did you capture, I think it has a great sense of time and place. How do you capture that when you're constrained by a relatively low budget? I mean, I think that was a real case of what I didn't know not being able to hurt me because I didn't, after I made that movie, everybody said that I did all of the things that you're not supposed to do on a really low budget first feature. And I had no idea because I didn't go to film school. I didn't know that was something to be afraid of. I didn't know doing a movie um, with, I mean, I think I had 40 locations in that movie too. I didn't kind of follow any of the things I was supposed to follow. I also had voiceover, which everyone was like, oh, you never do voiceover in your first movie. It's so, it's death. 
And I just didn't know that these were rules. Um, I've never heard that rule about no voiceover on your first movie. I don't know. Somebody told me that after the fact, just in all of the ways that I messed up, apparently. But I guess the thing was for me, because because I had worked on that project for so many years. And I think by the time I filmed it, I had written 85 drafts of that script. I knew it so inside and out and knew everything that I needed it to be that I, I actually felt like I was able to be really bold with my first filmmaking choices. I, I, I didn't know what to be afraid of. So if I wanted to do a scene in an all in one shot, I did it because I almost didn't know the things I should not do. You know, I, there was, um, a freedom in the fact that I had never done it before and didn't understand all of the ways that those things can go wrong. I didn't understand how many ways doing a 1976 movie in San Francisco could go wrong. People also said San Francisco is the hardest city to film a movie in. Um, for me, it was all cheats. It was like a lot of the city hasn't been remodeled, finding locations, shooting into the buildings. We, we had no money for cars. You know, we, we put ads on Craigslist saying, do you want your car to be famous? Do you have a car from the 60s and 70s? Do you want to come down? I mean, we paid people 20 bucks out of my pocket to come bring their cars down and be in the movie. Um, we did everything in the most budget way you can possibly imagine. And it was really just scrappy and it was out of love and everybody kind of coming together. It was also my family and my husband's family were all in the Bay Area. Everybody kind of banded together to try to help us figure out how to make it. But I kind of believe the, the uh, period piece thing is, is a myth. Like, I think you can do it. I've now made three movies, which technically are period movies. And I just don't think it's something to be afraid of. I think if you have a great costume designer who can really see beyond things and who knows how to, you know, work the thrift stores, you can figure out a way to make, I, I don't know that I think there are cheap ways to do period stuff. It just requires creativity. And yeah, as you might... Francisco, still parts of San Francisco still look like they did in the seventies. So much of San Francisco still looks like it does in the seventies. And because I grew up in the Bay area, I had this really fierce desire to represent San Francisco correctly because in film, it's a city that has not been represented very well. Um, everybody who's from the Bay area kind of feels like, you know, like Woody Allen came and made that m movie in San Francisco and it felt like a New York movie just put in San Francisco. None of the characters felt like they were really from there. It's a place that has a really specific culture and that culture is something that you can't really understand, I think, unless you're from there. But um, so I really, really wanted to do that city well and show it in the way that I knew that city to be. And having grown up in the Bay Area, like the culture of the people, the way the people interact with each other, the kind of deeper philosophical culture behind it of openness and um, kind of the new ageiness and how that really affects kids and relationships between grownups and adults and the deeper cultural questions of a city that you just don't see when you just take a movie that could be anywhere and just plant it in that city. Lulu, sorry, you were gonna say something? No, I just said maybe, you know, you, if you're doing a period piece, you might not, and you don't have a huge budget, you might not be doing like, you know, entire shots of the entire city. You might just like, limit it, but. But we found ways, you know, like we went up and found high peaks where we were like, all right, put this camera super low where you can't see the cars. And we did a few paint outs that we planned for and could afford, you know, um, and we found ways to give it scope, you know, filming in parks keeping away from cars, um, shooting into certain buildings. We found ways to give it scope, it felt like, you know, but it's creativity and a great DP who can help you to see things in that way. Um, Tyler asks uh, that studios like Marvel are, are hiring a lot more indie filmmakers to direct their films. Is this something that interests you or do you want to work on smaller, more personal films? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't say anything. I have no desire. To, I don't think that budget is the thing that's going to drive me one way or another. For me, it's about story and project and things that are going to touch my heart and that feel like I want to put into the world. I mean, I've made movies on very different budgets now between my three films. They've grown 
exponentially and they don't feel that different. Like, like we said, making a movie, I made diary in 24 days. I made, can you ever forgive me in 28? And it had a ton more money. <laughs> and then I made a beautiful day in 33. And so it's not like having a huge budget. I mean, maybe Marvel money makes you feel like it's a totally different ball game, but it, it all is the same challenges and it's whether it's touches you and speaks to you. Yeah, same. I'm, I'm, I would love to, to do a superhero movie. I would love to, you know, um, do action sequences. Like none of that stuff is what's um, keeping me from doing a Marvel movie. It is, it comes down to the script. It comes down to the themes that are explored. Um, and and I do believe, I, like, you know, I've said this before that um, if, if to jump from a very, very small indie into like that system, it's a different, you're, it is filmmaking much more by committee. Um, and you're, you know, much more it, it, yep. with that kind of budget comes different kinds of pressures and responsibilities and politics to navigate. Um, and for me, it's like, I think the more you establish your voice artistically, the more um, just having spoken to friends, the more freedom you might be given by the studio. Whereas if you jump too early, it's in a way it almost feels like they're doing you a favor by giving you yeah. that job. And that's the situation I don't want to be I in. I agree. If I were to do a movie like that, I would need to know I was truly in charge. And being given the amount of creative freedom that I've had in all three of my movies that really matters to me. And I would never want to feel like I was being told how to make that movie. Yeah. That's my yeah. biggest fear, I think, about doing one of those movies. Yeah, because I know people, it, it can break you, you know, like experience. Yeah like that where you don't agree but you're forced to keep your name on the project forced to to tell a story or explore a theme in a way that doesn't feel true to your values or you don't feel trusted you don't feel like yeah. people actually believe that you are the one with the vision behind the project I think the thing about filmmaking is it really does have to have a clear leader and as much as I love collaboration and I feel like Filmmaking is such a hugely collaborative art form and that's part of what I love. And I love bringing out the best in the people I'm working with, my DP and my editor and everybody getting to feel like they're bringing the best they can to the table and I'm not telling people what to do. But there still has to be, whose vision are we following? At the end of the day, when this person doesn't agree and this person doesn't agree, we all have different visions of where this is going. Who's telling us what movie we're making? Yeah. It has to come from one person. And when you make a movie like that, I think it can be really hard to be that person and you often are not given the trust you need. Agree. Um, Kelly says to you, Mary, uh, not a question, but hello from the Bay Area. I'm writing a limited series that takes place in 1978 in Northern California and I keep getting pushed back. I feel more confident now. Oh, good. Yeah, the Bay Area is the best. It was a great place to shoot a period piece. Our crew was amazing. There are not as many crew members there. And so you really have to find your people, but we had an incredible crew. I mean, it was such a magical shoot that we had in the Bay Area. It was really, really hard, but it was really incredible. And it's a beautiful city. I mean, it's a beautiful place to film. People just, I don't, for whatever reason, people are a little more afraid of filming there, but it's just a, it's such a gorgeous place to capture. Uh, for both of you, Faraz says, um, how do you separate yourself from writing and rewriting your film when you're directing your film as well? Uh, I, I rewrite so, 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 so much before prep that I try to get to a point where I feel like I have overly questioned every single bit of the script by the time we get there, but I still end up rewriting. Yeah. I love the, I mean, that's the thing that I've had to really learn um, is that, uh, you know, films are made in the rewrite process, you know, very rarely is for me anyways, I mean, maybe other people have a different process, but I have to, in order for me to get through my first draft, I have to think of the first draft as um, the the clay that I'm sculpting, you know, but that it's, I'm just collecting my materials and I'm putting it all there mm -hmm. into a pile, into a shapeless form. And then as I rewrite, I'm chiseling away and starting to see what this sculpture wants to be. 
um, and 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 uh, and so even when I'm directing something that I don't write, it's in that rewrite process where I'm doing my pass at it, or that I start to find the tone, I start to find the the voice because so often you might get a script that's great, but it's like it's a drama. Here's the drama, and I'm like, how do I subvert that? How do I you know make it funnier? How do I make it feel a little bit weirder? You know, and and I think that's the the writing directing like connection. I will say. I agree with all of that. And I think rewriting is writing and anybody who claims that they write a perfect first draft is full of shit. But, uh, but I do think it is sometimes hard when you're actually in production to resist. Sometimes you have the urge to rewrite just because something's not quite working in the moment. Sometimes that's an indication that there's a problem on the page, but sometimes you have to figure out why you're not capturing what's on the page. Right. You know, sometimes you have to be like, no, I'm not just going to rewrite this. Maybe we need to reblock it. Maybe we need to put the camera in a different position. Maybe we need the actors to have a different rhythm. Like there was a reason why we landed here. And if you trust your script, sometimes going back to the script and not just tossing it out. And I've seen directors who really just, if, if something doesn't work immediately, they toss the this, this script out and try to rewrite it rather, especially in TV. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's that can be kind of a slippery slope and sometimes really going back to the script and going, why did we write it this way? What, what were the things we were trying to convey? What are we missing? I mean, I go through every scene and just if I say to myself, if everything goes wrong and I only capture one thing, what's the thing in this scene I have to capture? Like I have to get this moment where this exchange happens. He changes how he feels about her or she finds her strength or whatever that one emotional turn that has to happen. And you can say, even if that's the only thing I get right, that's the thing we're going to capture. And usually your script has those clues if you've worked long enough on it and it's in a positive enough place by the time you start filming, that sometimes it is tempting to just throw it out on the day and you, you shouldn't, you should figure out how to make it work. Yeah. And, and I think that's even a, like, I've discovered that the the problems that I've ha had in the script, but I'm like, no, it's fine. Let's just keep pushing. Like they are still a problem on oh, stage. Yes. They're a problem in post production. But if you know what, like, like you were just saying, what that scene is about, not the dialogue. You know, you can fall in love with dialogue, but you have to know. Okay, this is a scene that's all about these two people connecting. This is where they fall in love. This is the moment that they fall in love. Yeah. So then when you get to set, you're not just gonna toss it out or completely, but you might say, you know what? We don't have the time to shoot all this dialogue, right? Cause you know, whatever the reason is we're losing light, you know, we're, you know, the, the day is much shorter. Oh, hi Wiley. Hi. Um, thousands of people are watching. <laughs> but you know, I, I think that's where you can, um, sorry. Um, that's, that's where you can like, um, you know, you can go, I don't need this dialogue. Let's just do this whole scene yeah. one shot and get yes. it in the next 15 minutes. And well, because you always have time. that pressure. You always have people going like, do we really need this? Do, does, can we, always. yeah. Can we skip this or can we just do, get a short thing instead? And sometimes you can. And sometimes you can say, okay, we could just get this in one look, or we could get this, I just need to see this longing, or I just need to see this wistful look, or I just need to see you guys connect or touch each other, and that would do enough. But if you know what that scene is, then you, you can do that. Yeah, and that's always the best because sometimes, a lot of times, it ends up being better, right? Because you're forced to, again, yeah. the limitations. And then sometimes I'll get a question where people will be like, like this scene is so great and it's just silent and you know how did you know to just do it silent and you're like it's because we didn't have time and so <laughs> it was supposed to be a whole conversation that I yeah. up, but now it just turned into a hug you know but people think that that is the way it was planned all along right but you have to know your story so inside and out in order to be able to make those calls on the day yeah Maria had a question about living with having a filmmaker partner and whether they're involved in the rewriting or like feedback. We have in common, Mark. I know. We, we definitely talk about this. I mean, my husband does such different types of movies than I do, like such big, broad comedies, but he and I very much are involved in each other's work. Probably him more in mine than I am in his. Like, I am 
sort of guilty of not always understanding or getting the jokes that he wants to tell in his projects. Like, like when he told me he wanted to write this song called Dick in a Box, I was like, that's really stupid. Like, don't do that. I really don't like that. <laughs> so I can't really get as involved in his stuff. But he um, was a producer on Diary and was incredibly supportive in getting that movie made. And um, so early on, like, he's been very involved in many processes for me, but it it's a lot less now that we have a kid because it feels like he can't be on set with me if I'm filming a movie because he has to be primary parent and vice versa. So as much as we'd like to be able to and we watch cuts of each other's things and read thing, read scripts and stuff, we can't be quite as involved as we used to be. I also used to kind of, like when they made their first movie, Hot Rod, I was on set most of the time, kind of just giving my thoughts and feedback and like being a support, a supportive person and a presence. And we can't do that as much now that we're parents. Yeah. Um, Alexis, who is online, says he can offer or she can offer uh, some referrals for people in the Bay Area. So if there's anyone in the Bay Area that wants um, support, uh, email uh, education at filmindependent.org. Alexis, if you could do the same, we'll try and connect you. Uh, we're pretty much out of time here. Apologies for not getting to all these questions. Our final one for both of you is always, um, what are you watching? What, what, uh, what can you recommend people that is outside of the algorithms? Mm. Other than uh, Real Housewives. <laughs> that's all I'm watching though. If that's, that's what's getting me through this pandemic. Well, Real Housewives the movie. <laughs> we're watching a ton we're watching i mean that's the one thing is we're not involved in each other's work um and and haven't been and and right now even though we're like quarantined together and both working on things i'd i'd like to have that separation but the one thing that we do have together is that we watch something together every single night every single night um so it's been a lot of television we're watching right and uh with a lot more than normally we're, we try to watch more films but um just we need some just like silly escape or whatever but we've watched a lot of great television like uh we watched unorthodox I, we watched, we're gonna start that i'm excited to watch unorthodox yeah we watched um never uh never have i ever mm -hmm. um it's amazing we we're like we binged the whole thing in two days it's um it's so good um but we watched solaris recently uh the you know, so we're going back and visiting some some older films that either Barry loves or that I've love I love that the other person hasn't seen before. Mm -hmm. That's so fun. I wish we had more time for that. We're, we've started The Crown from the beginning because we've never oh, watched The Crown. I've never seen that. Yeah, it's so delightful. And I mean, there was a whole crazy storyline about when um, London got shut down because of the horrible fog that was really smog from all of the coal. And it's everyone's in masks and it, it felt a little too much for right now to kind of see people dying in hospitals with masks on. Um, but other than that, it's been good escapism and just beautiful filmmaking and beautiful acting. And it's nice. But because we have a kid, we just don't have the time. To, I would love to be making our way through film archives and like really getting to enjoy. I've also been watching projects of my friends who are editing projects, who are sending me things, and then I get to give notes on things. And that's my favorite thing to do right I now. I love that, yeah. It's so wonderful when you're like, this isn't my project. I get to watch it. I get to give you thoughts. You get to see I'm, it get better and better. Yeah. yeah. And it, it makes you feel connected to something outside of your own little home, whatever that is right now. It just, so I'm grateful that I'm getting to watch cuts of other people's stuff. Yeah. Well, if you haven't seen Train to Busan, I just have to oh. say, um, we, we watched that and it was one of the most fun nights of uh, viewing that we've had so far. Um, Train to Busan and then there's the, the animated prequel, Soul Station. Oh no, um, wow. But yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's very quarantine. Um, it, it's very like, it, it makes sense to watch it during the quarantine. It's about zombies and whatever, but it's so well done and it's fun. And we were both just like screaming at the television. <laughs> That's great. Have you seen Kingdom? Lulu? No, I haven't seen that. Yeah, it's a, another Korean zombie show. 
but it's set in sort of uh, 16th century Korea. Oh, it's a series? Yeah. Okay, great. Another spin on the Korean zombie theme. <laughs> um, out. Thank you both. Uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, this has been a Coffee Talk with Film Independent. Uh, don't forget that we have a special running right now. Um, 14 months of membership for the price of 12, i.e. two months free, no matter which membership level, um, whether you're a new member or a renewing member. But uh, I'll say my goodbyes and also my thank yous to Mariel Heller. Thank you, Mariel. Thank you. This was so fun. Obviously, Lulu and I could talk forever. It's really fun. We'll just have yeah. to do it on our own sometime, Mari. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <they're full> <laughs> exactly. Well, if you want to come back soon and suggest uh, another pairing, we'd love, we'd love to have you back. Um, also, Lulu Wong. Thank you, Lulu. Thank you for having me. Come back soon. You both stay safe, healthy, and sane, and uh, we'll see you both soon. <laughs>